You're listening to the Whole Church Podcast. Our efforts to educate and unite the church are made possible thanks to our sponsors on Patreon. Please consider joining them for $3 a month to get access to our special series like our Pet Peeve series, where we ask our guests about their pets and about any peeves they may have with the church. Thank you for listening. Romans 12, 15 through 18 in the Christian Standard Bible reads, Rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud. Instead, associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Give careful thought to do what is honorable in everyone's eyes. If possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Uh, Christian Ashley, how should we understand this passage when we're thinking about sitting with people's hurt and dealing with these stories of abuse? When it comes to someone else's hurt, You are not the main character. It is our responsibility in that moment to listen, to do our best to understand, to ask questions that aren't probing in a way that demeans that person, but to give them an opportunity to speak freely and safely. I would argue that there's some similarities between my advising practice and this spiritual practice. A lot of times people simply want heard and validated, whether they're angry, whether they're sad. Just let them get it out. Just let them get it out and process it. Don't interrupt. Don't contradict until they've said their piece. Once they have calmed down, that is when you can start moving into problem solving. All right. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Whole Church Podcast. I'm not sure what to do here. Uh, usually, my only job is to introduce the greatest co-host of all time, TJ Tiberius Mont Blackwell, but his power is out. So you guys are stuck with me, but, but, don't give up on this show yet. We have two wonderful guests, uh, my good friend Christian Ashley, who is associated with the non-denominational church as well as the Southern Baptist Church, getting ready to go to seminary at uh, Southern Baptist Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky, right? Yes, sir. And then we also have with us the one and only, uh, possibly our listeners' favorite Catholic, Ooh, although we have a few. I just remembered Sister Rose. Man, you got some competition. Oh, <laughs> Professor I, 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 Chris Moreland. She takes the cake. I, I, I don't even hold a candle to her. So. Um, yeah, that's um, I mean, that's that's a hard one to hard one to. Yeah. <laughs> but we do have the one and only Professor Chris Moreland, um, who, as you've heard in the prelude, is a school advisor, as well as a professor, as well as just, you know, a cool guy. So. We're excited to talk with him. He'll be representing the Catholic Church today. Today was originally going to be one of our roundtable discussions, but most of the roundtable did not was not able to make it, including our co-host. <laughs> but but we could not leave the church dry. We couldn't leave you alone, listeners. We know you're lonely out there, so we wanted to lend you our voices to give you some perspectives on some impromptu thoughts dealing with the issues today. That being said, uh, since TJ's not here, I'm, I'm going to let him know, let you guys know for him that you should jump over to our Facebook group if you want to join in some other impromptu conversations. Because sometimes I just ask random bombs over there and you guys can, you know, tune in. It's a fun time, mostly. And of course, guys, I, I'm sure you both know this, but I, I have a favorite form of silliness. Um, and I don't want to give our round table silly question away just yet because it was good. So I'm trying to impromptu come up with a silly question, and I think I got it. If you had to one-on-one play a sport with an orangutan, which sport do you think you would choose and why? I'll go first, give you guys some time to think. I'm going to go with golf. Uh, I just don't think the orangutan has the patience to play it. Like, sure, he'll beat me on the drive, but I think when it comes to the putting, he'll just get frustrated. That's sort of my thought process. Uh, Christian, what sport would you choose to play one-on-one with an orangutan? What's the one you play on the lawn with the little (laughs) arches and the mallet? Croquet. 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 I think I have the motor skills to beat an orangutan in that. Okay. All right. That's solid. Solid. All right, Professor Moreland, you're going one-on-one with an orangutan in which sport? I would do lacrosse because you could sort of use the stick to keep him at bay. (laughs) fun (laughs) all right guys well (laughs) we all picked sophisticated sports to play with an orangutan i think the 
The only sophisticated sports that would be wrong answers would be if you're trying to play rugby, which isn't a one-on-one sport, or maybe um, if you try to play squash with an orangutan, I think that just sounds too dangerous. Don't do that. We we do not recommend that as the whole church. That being said, <laughs> um, yeah, so Professor Moreland, this one's just going to be to you. Last time we gave a few suggestions on our round table of some of the cliches that aren't really helpful when it comes to hurt that we think people maybe should avoid. Um, some of the ones we came up with is you're not mad at God or the church. You're mad at people. And that shouldn't be why you're going to church anyway. Um, you know, a lot of times people just like to blame the woman, how she dresses, her behavior. Um, victims use intelligent answers like, well, you know, I left the church because X, Y, Z, when really they're just hurt. Um, it's not God's fault. That's something people tell victims. You know, it's not God's fault. Just go to church anyway. I, you know, who cares that you got hurt? Um, just pray about it. The one that Father Jonathan threw out there. You're not mature enough to understand yet. That was uh, Christian Ashley's. <laughs> um, Professor Moylan, have you heard any other cliches that people throw at victims of abuse or people who've been hurt by the church that you think are just not helpful things to say? Just get over it. That's a big one. Yeah. That's one that's like so cringy. It's almost like I just don't want to, I don't want to say it. I don't want to think about it. <laughs> I don't care enough about it. You know, just get over it. Yeah, we, we act as though because you're Christian, you're supposed to be tough. So you can just take whatever, just deal with it. And it's like, that's not, that's not how people work, guys. <laughs> um, all right. Well, Professor Moreland, one thing we were going to ask you specifically in today's roundtable um, that I did want to go ahead and talk about while we had you. A lot of Protestants, we talked about this last time, but a lot of Protestants in the 90s pointed at the Catholic problem of abuse coming from the priest. And use that as a, we don't have the problem. See, it's them. They have a problem, not us. Obviously, as time went on, more and more things come out. It's not just them. It's also the Protestants. It's also all religious organizations, I would argue. Um, And as time goes on, I think you'll see it more and more, unfortunately. Um, You know, I'm sure people know recently there was a report with the SBC, the Southern Baptist Convention. Some people now are just pointing as, oh, Baptist, you know, it's not all Protestants which is not a helpful thing to do, I want to throw out there. And hopefully we'll talk about that in a minute. But Professor Moreland, the Catholic Church has been open about its problem and dealing with it and trying to figure this thing out, at least for the last 30 years, probably longer. What can you tell us about the history of how the Catholic Church has dealt with this issue and what you think other churches can learn from the model you guys have been putting out there? Well, it's certainly been an imperfect solution. We have progressed quite a ways from the days of the 90s, but in some ways we have also regressed. So it's complicated. The church is a big ship and it takes a long time to steer. Looking back, you have to understand not just in Catholicism, but in the entire society, that the culture of the 1990s was very much about suck it up, deal with it, move on, don't cause problems, don't rock the boat. And if you're a victim, you must have done something to cause it. So even if, let's say, your share of the guilt was only 10% and the other person's was 90, it didn't matter. You would bring scandal upon your family. You'd bring scandal upon your community. It would look bad. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you would try to talk about these things and you would be shut down or yelled at um, or told to grow up, get over it. So that was the culture then. What was troubling also about the 90s was that whenever there was a problem with Catholic priest or bishop, you made front page news. It was on Time Magazine, Newsweek. Mm -hmm. But I can tell you how many times that... When a Catholic priest was caught doing something like this, it would get on the front page of our hometown newspaper. But guess what youth pastor Rick ended up in? (laughs) He ended up buried in a slight little snippet between two advertisements. And it's the same issue. And that used to really be galling. And there was this idea Mm -hmm. that this was a uniquely Catholic problem. And I think that intersected with a lot of anti-Catholic and nativist prejudice that dates back centuries. Also, Mm -hmm. 
there were a lot of people within the Catholic Church who were opposed to John Paul II and opposed to his interpretation of the Second Vatican Council that saw this as an opportunity to damage him and to damage his legacy. So you had people who made a lot of the sex abuse crisis. How have we moved forward? Well, the church is made up of like 1.3 billion people. So I'm really going to look at the United States, and I'm going to look at the dioceses that I'm the most familiar with. Mm -hmm. I know that what has really helped is to put the individual first and the reputation of the church second. Justice needs to be provided for the accused and the accuser because there have been false accusations, and those are almost the equivalent of a death sentence because it is a public form. of It is like a social execution, essentially. So justice needs to be done, and recompense needs to be made. What we found is that when people are heard, when people are listened to, when people have access to the hierarchy, the bishops, the cardinals, the archbishops, priests, vicar generals, that that alone, having the access really helps. Being heard helps. And then also being ready to give the person what it is they need. Some people don't want money. They don't. They want reforms. They want to, they want proof that what happened to them will never happen to someone else. And a lot of these people who have been hurt are faithful Catholics who have been scandalized and betrayed by priests in the model of Judas Iscariot and the bishops that have cowardly protected them. Mm. If people will find closure with money, so be it. Most of the time when people want money, though, it's not out of greed. It is out of trying to balance out the, their medical bills, the mental health, um, the post-traumatic stress disorder. These are expensive things to treat. And I think it's incredibly fair for the church to assist with that. Um, so that has really helped. That has really helped. Giving people access, you know, not hiring the PR companies, not worrying so much about the way the church is going to look because that ship has sailed. What is it that we can do for the individual person who has suffered from this? My doctoral advisor in uh, Berkeley, Father Joseph Kenichi, pioneered this approach when he was the um, when he was the head of the Franciscan friars of the province of Santa Barbara, and he wrote a book about it called um, "When Values Collide." And it was that person-focused approach that made him so distinct from other dioceses and other organizations that were more worried about optics, whereas he was worried about the individual person in front of him because they're a soul, they're a fellow Christian, and it's part of their spiritual experience mm -hmm. um, is horrible as it is, it's it's a chapter in someone's spiritual life, a chapter of desolation and horror, but a chapter nonetheless. So mm -hmm. I would say that that transparency and toning down the defensiveness in the institution has really helped. Yeah. So I did want to say, um, you mentioned the people who claimed victimhood or said someone did something that didn't really happen. Mm -hmm. um, we know those cases are rare. I, I'm sure both of you would probably agree with me. But even if it's one out of a hundred, that does so much more damage because it makes more people not want to believe the victims. And I don't have an answer for how do we go about that because, hey, not to get pop culture on everybody, but when you look at stuff like the, the Johnny Depp Amber Heard trial, you know, if he didn't do what he was accused of, you know, he obviously shouldn't be punished for it. And yet a lot of our, you know, more liberal news stations are saying, no, it'd be better if he was punished anyway. 
just mm-hmm. so that, you know, people would understand that they really are victims. That's not justice. Moving on. Um, <laughs> I'd like to drop bombs and just move forward. Um, <laughs> something you were talking about as far as it's not about the church's reputation. That really brings up a lot of the SBC stuff where they were trying to hide stuff and all this stuff because their lawyer said, you know, something about the reputation. One thing that has bothered me for years were how many times cases would come up and you would see that there was a non-disclosure agreement. Mm-hmm. That annoyed me so much because to me, that's the same thing as saying you're guilty, but trying like obviously trying to hide it. What what did you guys what is your take on the non-disclosure disclosure agreement? Am I on base there or am I judging too harshly, maybe? It sounds extremely cowardly to me, just on face value. I mean, yeah. maybe there's something out there where they signed it just to get out of the way and there was nothing going on. And they just wanted to kill rumors. But I'm going to guess the majority, it was, I've done something wrong. I don't want it out in the public eye. I want to get a court. So let me sign this instead. And I can go committing my sins over here in the dark while I'm proclaiming the light. Hmm. Yeah. I can't speak much to non-disclosure agreements. I've never had to sign one when working for the church. But I will say that something that is very common with abusers is that they isolate their victims silence them and protect and prevent them from going public and they make them think you are the only person that has happened to so you must have done something to bring it on Mm -hmm. you you must have done something and the victim will not speak but then you start discovering that when the wall of silence breaks it's been going on for decades and it's not just you And it's not limited to a certain demographic because sometimes people think, well, it's because I'm a woman. It's because I'm a man. It's because I came from this family or that family or I was rich or I was poor. Usually you find in these situations that it is across the board. And of course, when we're talking about hurt in the church, um, sexual abuse isn't the only issue, right? Uh, we, We talked about verbal abuse, spiritual abuse. People just being mean and ungenerous. I mean, there, there's a lot of type of hurt that happens. Some people just feel neglected or left out. And one of the things when we talked about that last time that Father Jonathan brought up was having the church learn or having people in the church learn when you don't have to tell them the truth, when you don't have to correct them and say, no, no, this is how it is. You're wrong about that. And you can just know when to sit there and listen and hear people out. Um. I'm going to throw this to Christian first, since since I gave you the last one first. <laughs> uh, Christian, how do we know when to stand for truth, when to argue with someone about what's right, and when to just sit with them and stay with their hurt? And, and why can't we just do both all the time? Why can't I tell them, hey, you're wrong, but hey, I'm here? It's going to be trial and error at the start, because you're going to screw up. It's just going to mm-hmm. happen, and we have to get over that fear, not to be like, I'm just going to go guns blazing into this conversation And I'll fix it the next time I have this conversation. It's Mm -hmm. you need to learn how to respond to someone else. See, for me, I don't understand other people's emotions that easily. It is extremely difficult. And it has taken years of God putting each of the side. Okay, how did you handle yourself there? Did they get a chance to speak? You were defending me, you thought, but really you're just crippling them. Give them an opportunity to speak. Listen first, then take the time to think. What would God want me to say in this moment? But Christian, what if their their statement starts with, I'm not sure if God's real. I and mean, we have to stop them right there and give them like the, you know, the whole lecture of, you know, Wayne Grudem's systematic theology, break down the whole book, right? <laughs> I mean, if they're not sure God's real, I mean, obviously there's a huge divide already. So, yeah. I mean, that could be a discussion for another day, or it could be that's what they need right now is to hear, you know, your arguments for or against, you know, a creator God being real and loving you and having a relationship with you. But ultimately, at the end of the day, what they're really worried about is their hurt. Professor Moreland, when when do we know when to sit with someone's hurt and when to argue what is and isn't right with them? I would say that if the conversation is ongoing, you've established rapport with someone, and you've gotten past that initial hurt, and you have created a place where both of you feel authentic and safe, then you can start pushing back a bit against certain ideas because we can acknowledge people's hurt. 
and the validity of their lived experiences. But that does not mean that we have to approve of every coping mechanism a person uses to deal with that hurt. So if the per if the person in question is doing things that are objectively harmful to themselves or to other people or are going to be counterproductive, we have every right to stand for the truth and to direct them into different, more productive pathways that will be healing for them. Mm -hmm. However, it may not be our place to do that. That might be something that a clinical psychologist or medical professional would need to do. So we have to also acknowledge what are our limitations? What are we trained and skilled to do? And what do we need to refer to another person? I'm going to give you guys a case study so I can kind of get a better idea of what you're both trying to say with this. Uh, a good friend of mine once, I don't know if they would have ever said they walked away from the faith, but either walked away from the faith or came pretty close to it. We're really questioning God's existence, all of that kind of stuff. A lot of anger towards the entire idea of religion um, because their grandfather, who was also their best friend, passed away. They were really close to. He was their one connection to, I guess, the religion world, really. And then the brother also almost died in a pretty short time frame. And it was kind of one of those Job situations where it's like, oh, why, why would God let this happen? If there's a God, why is this happening to me? Is that the time that we should argue with him about the problem of pain? Or like, how, how would you how would you handle that situation when they're just angry at the idea of religion because of all this? Assuming they came to you to talk to you. <laughs> um, Professor Moreland, did you want to take that one first? It's not unusual for people to be very angry at institutions or concepts when they've experienced a personal loss. And I think that it's just important to be patient and let them feel that. Usually, if they're given the space to deal with that and they aren't cut off, eventually they're going to start focusing on more narrow issues rather than being angry at the entire concept of God or the entire concept of religion, particularly if they're under care of a clinical psychologist, they may be able to narrow in and zero in on what is the core issue that they need to resolve. So you say, let them kind of handle their mental health first, and then approach again when, I don't know, maybe they're able to be approached better? Mm -hmm. Is that sort of what you're getting at? I would, I would definitely say so. I think that, you know, both spiritual and mental health are incredibly integrated. So it's not an either or. But I would venture to say that, you know, for example, if something, if the root cause of something is pharmacological, it's going to be very difficult to have a spiritual conversation with someone if they are not being compliant with their medication. Um because a lot of these things that they may think are spiritual problems are actually problems of brain chemistry, perhaps. Uh, Christian, if you were given the same example, you know, angry, all these things happen to him, just angry at the idea of religion. Um, are you taking us pretty much the same approach or what are, what are you thinking if they come to you to talk to you? Are they asking me, why would a loving God do this? Or are they just in general upset? Um, I think they might be, Asking, but kind of vent asking, you know, why, why God do that? If, if God's real, why is this happening to me? Why is this happening? Why, well, you know, kind of just unloading on you. If it's the vent asking, I'm not going to focus on the answers just yet. I'm going to let them have their time to speak. After a while, then we can come to, you know, we can talk about the problem of evil. We can talk about why our time here on earth is so finite. But right now, the first thing that needs to be done is helping them deal with their hurt. And losing someone like that, especially almost losing someone else back to back, really stings. And I'll give an example from my own life. Uh, when I was 15, my maternal grandfather passed away. And that man was my hero growing up. Uh, one of mm -hmm. several I had, but like, we just got each other. And it felt like God just took him away from me. But at the end of the day, I had a lot of really good and very strong Christians around me who listened to what I had to say, who answered questions when it was time to answer questions, and then helped me understand our time here is short. And he knew Jesus. So why would I ever want him to remain here when hmm. he's somewhere better? Now, that's a whole different question <laughs> yeah. if that person didn't know Jesus, never knew him as their savior. 
that's a whole different ballpark. But like, I would start first with letting them get their feelings out first before I even tried to answer anything. And if I don't know, I'm going to send them to someone who can. Yeah. Yeah. I like that mental health aspect is an important thing to keep, keep in mind and love first preach later. Maybe. Yeah. I mean, yeah. um, well, love is a type of preaching, I think, but yeah. that's another discussion, <laughs> <laughs> man. Um, well, you, you kind of brought up personal examples. So I, I just go ahead and ask both of you. You know, I said this wasn't going to be a round table, and it turns out that I, I guess it sort of is. Uh, maybe this is our triangle table. Welcome to our triangle table episode, everybody. <laughs> um, Professor Moreland, I'm going to ask you this one first. I want to kind of hear from both of you. Have there ever been a moment in your life where somebody else just sat with you and you're hurt and you found that helpful? Oh, yes. Absolutely. I mean, my friends. Um, so I've been very, very lucky to have a a group of friends that is large in quantity and deep in quality, and they've been consistent over the past 20 years with some additions and subtractions, but overall the same core group. And yes, we're always there for each other when one of us is hurting. And I'm lucky to probably have at least 10 people that I could go to at any time and be very authentic about, you know, pain and agitation and anything, you know, whether it's spiritual or professional or academic. Yeah. Um, they've, but we, but I provide that also for them. We're all, we, you know, we support and we lean at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. I personally, um, after my first time trying to go to college, I went to UNCW and ended up on academic probation. A lot of other emotional, terrible things were kind of going on, which kind of led to some of my academic failures. I ended up having a friend who happened to be a Christian, but we weren't part of the same church or church group or anything, drive all the way to Charlotte where I was at it one day because he kind of figured out that I wasn't leaving and no one was really hearing from me. And he said, no, I'm just dragging you out of the house. <laughs> You are going to leave today and we're going to not talk about it. And we're just going to do something. And that, I think, I don't, I don't know if I would have recovered without that friend. So, um, Christian, same thing. Has there, there been any other examples maybe of people who just sat with you and hurt and you found that to be a more helpful experience than even maybe the truth would have been at that moment? Um, I mentioned on the last, well, I guess that's, this isn't the next round table, whatever. We'll deal with it. On Our the triangle last table. One, <laughs> that um, I had had an issue with my pastor at the time, uh, based mm -hmm. on what a man is supposed to be, was really the crux yeah. of it. And, you know, my, my pride issues as well, and how he dealt with that in a fairly poorly handled way. So I did, for a while, I didn't do anything because I thought, well, if I talked to my old pastor, it'd be like, I'm just going behind his back. And, you know, like I'm seeking him instead. I should be, you know, lifting up my current pastor. It was like, no, I needed to talk to people. I talked to my old youth pastor. I talked to my old. Uh, my old pastor, who's pastor of my current church right now, I talked to my parents. And it's like, how do I handle this issue? I I want to respect this man, but at the same time, I am dying spiritually under his authority. And mm -hmm. the general yeah. answer was, you don't work together well. Go somewhere else. And that felt like a it felt like a betrayal. It's like, aren't I supposed to maintain unity? Aren't I supposed to you know, just listen to those who are above me? But I had to learn, it's like, they're just people who don't mesh well together. And it's okay to leave as long as, you know, reasons are given for why. You don't just ghost them. And yeah. that's what I had to learn. And I wouldn't have done that. I would have just remained where I was and been miserable and depressed without my family and friends and former pastors. Yeah. And that's something we kind of see modeled by um, St. Paul in, in the Bible, especially when you go through Acts. There's a few different times he parts ways with, with people. Um, I think some people use that as an excuse for church splits. It's not. Because if you notice, he parts ways because they don't mesh well and then proceeds to uplift them and talk positively about their ministry throughout his other works. So it's it's not him leaving them being, I'm done with them. We can't have the same church. No, it's we have the same church. We don't mesh well. So you have the same church over there so we can spread the gospel further. Great example. Always love to talk about Paul when I can. Um, <laughs> I, you know, Christian's example was kind of of church hurt and how people being there helped him. Um, I feel like professor Moylan, you and I kind of just more generic hurt in general. Sometimes it's just good to be there. 
I think there are other times where it's good to may, maybe just shut up and be there. <laughs> I, I know this is a little bit controversial, but back when there was the big Ken Ham and Bill Nye debate and they had the, you know, evolution versus creation thing. I, I remember to me, a lot of people were like, oh, this guy clearly won or this guy clearly won. Whoever side you were on, your side clearly won at the end, obviously. Um, but I remember watching those. And the only thing I could take away, and of course, this is me being the church unity guy. So, of course, this was my takeaway was neither of them seemed different. Like if I was to watch that and you were to tell me one of them was religious and one of them wasn't, I, you would not be able to tell from their candor or their attitude. And again, I know I'm hurting some people talking about Ken Ham this way. I'm not saying he's not a Christian. What I'm saying is when I watched that debate, there was no there was no light. There was no love. There was just I'm right or you're right. And I wonder if you guys think. Maybe that's a good example. Maybe there are other examples. Do you think there are other times other than just hurt when it's better to just shut up and be there for people or just shut up and exist and be the church? Well, first off, um, you said that. Christian, I'm put you on the spot. Yeah, yeah. You put that in a very kind and diplomatic way. Uh, <laughs> I have I try. other choice words I would use for the both of them. Uh, that by God's grace I need to not use now. I'm, yeah, just as its own issue, what your point would being is that they are not representing themselves well, and Mr. Ham especially is not representing the gospel well in that moment. The point of those debates was, I'm right and you're wrong, and if you don't mm -hmm. get it, you're just stupid. Yeah. And, and that's true. And that's... <laughs> that's why they're both stupid. They didn't say what I wanted them to. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, we can debate creation versus evolution every single day, but at the core, that conversation never happens without God creating everything that doesn't happen without Jesus coming to die for our sins. So those are the things we need to worry about. Like uh, right now in America, you know, Roe v. Wade just got overturned. And that has brought immense joy to my heart initially because I don't want babies to be murdered. But at the end of the day, how I've seen my fellow Christians handle this has made me want to join the other side because yeah. it's like we won. You guys suck. Like just deal with it versus, okay, on the worst take I've heard is now we can do something about it. You've had 50 years to help women who have no one in their lives to help them, to give them food, to mm -hmm. watch for the baby, to give her a night out on her own. You've had money you can offer to these shelters, to these people who need help. And you just stood by and did nothing because, oh, well, we're going to fight for life. But after it's born, we don't care. I actually, um, one of my best friends is agnostic. You know, he's not a Christian. And one of the fun things that I, I've learned just from our discussions with him is so, something he likes to say regularly is nobody wants abortions. Nobody wants dead babies. Like nobody's going around like, man, I hope I get pregnant just so I can, you know, like no, no one's thinking those kind of things. Hmm. And one thing you end up learning that I, I find really interesting that I think people should look into. You look at the two states that had the most impact on decreasing abortion. One was Texas because, you know, they tried to ban it really hard. Um, I think the other one was Vermont, and it was a northern state, but it was because they supported women really well, so they didn't feel like they needed it. There, I wonder if we do more harm by arguing <laughs> than we do help with our solutions. Um, and that, you know, that's just one case. Uh, Professor Mullen, do you think there are other times where maybe we would do better to be a little quieter? Well, yeah, we should we should practice the gift of discernment and know what battles to pick, what hills to die on, and where that the conversation, where arguing or talking too much is just not going to help the situation. The light sometimes gets in, not from the front door, but from the side or from the back, and that's where you know we have to discern. But there are a lot of times where, for example, if someone is in pain, you know, being present, and even engaging in just normal daily activities with them, whether it's working alongside them or, you know, going on a hike or going to the beach or something like that. Just going through the rituals of normality. If someone's in a lot of pain, that normality can be incredibly healing for them. I mean, that's, you know, when I said earlier, my friend drugged me out and made me do something. And that was it. Just a little bit of normality. And... Christian, you brought up the abortion thing, and I'm not wise enough to get away from it. So many people, they just 
are scared right now from this decision, from this decision, people we don't agree with, maybe, you know, I know some parts of the church believe differently on this particular issue, but there are a lot of people who are genuinely scared that their choice, that their rights are being taken away. Who cares if they're right or not? Why don't we love them? I mean, yes, the, the, your vote, yeah, your vote matters. Being involved in politics is cool. I'm fine with that. I'm for that. But it doesn't negate your responsibility as a Christian to love these people. Um, do either of y'all have anything you'd like to add or, you know, respond to the other about that we've, you know, we've covered a lot already? I mean, it just feels like our goal is to win without caring about other people is what mm. the world looks at us like. It's like, oh, well, Roe v. Wade was overturned. That's great. And I want that to happen. But we didn't kill abortion forever. It's going to keep happening. Mm. People are still going to be hurt by it. People are going to be hurt by the fact that it's no longer available. What are we doing? Are we working to help people? Or are we satisfied with the end result? Oh, well, I lobbied enough politicians and now it's gone. I don't have to care anymore. (laughs) Schadenfreude is not a Christian virtue. Amen. Mm -hmm. We can feel feel vindicated by justice. That is... I believe that comes from the spirit, but we must discern the difference between feeling vindicated by justice and feeling like we've got one over on people or sucks to be you. That's schadenfreude, and it is not of God, in my opinion. It is not. I feel like there's this competitive, arrogant spirit behind it all. Oh, gosh, yeah. yeah. Well, and it's the spirit of division. It's, it's the spirit of division because yeah. I really believe that, that Satan's goal is to essentially atomize everyone and to make everyone an island of themselves by constantly splitting and dividing people over more and more specific issues. And our country is deeply polarized and just as like, you know, we're not breathing with two lungs. We don't do well if one of our lungs is diseased and the other one's perfectly healthy. So even with people that I strongly disagree with, I want them to have better arguments and better ways of making their points known. So I'm not going to condone and I am not going to sit back if people think that the best way to deal with this is to decapitate statues of the Blessed Virgin and our Lord Jesus Christ, to desecrate the Eucharist. Mm-hmm. to graffiti our churches and our schools and our our hospitals that is not something that i plan on ever accompanying anyone with those are acts of hatred and if they took place against any other religion it would be on the front page of the new york times but when people are in pain and are dealing with these emotions these fears that's when that's when you really can just choose to let them feel that way and you don't have to convince them necessarily you don't have to argue with them if it's a sore spot right now it's probably better to not go there and to not talk about it yeah i um I, i'd like to read again from our prelude we did a romans 12 15 through 18 i'm going to read verse 18 and uh, close some people in on what verse 19 does not say so we have Romans twelve eighteen says, if possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. It does not follow up with, you know, unless they're wrong, and then you got to throw that in their face. Or it doesn't follow up with, but if you win, you should at least brag about it. You know, it doesn't follow up with, if you don't like what they're doing, if they're not a Christian, if any of this, it says, be at peace with everyone. <laughs> That's different from unity, mind you. I, I get that. But you still got to have peace with them. You still got to love them. Christian, you've been dying to say something, and we keep cutting you off, man. <laughs> it's okay. It's part of learning when to speak and when not to speak. Um, <laughs> yeah, what's uh, what's going on? I mean, it, this this entire scenario, I'll give an example of youthful enthusiasm in a stupid way. Uh, when I was <laughs> in high school, our football team beat the opposing team, who was one of our rivals, and one of my best friends at the time and I went from our side of the stadium to theirs. And started yelling at him, like, we're the best, you guys suck, all these terrible things, not acting in the most godly manner possible. Well, we almost got our butts whooped. You know why? 
because we presented our argument in a terrible way. Mm. If I go mm. into the middle of UNC and I say Duke is the greatest basketball team of all time, which I believe, mm. you might be right. I'm going to get crucified. You know why? Because I'm in enemy territory. You don't do that. <laughs> if I'm yeah. approaching someone about the gospel that does not believe in Jesus, there are already so many hurdles I have to jump over to get to that conversation in the first place. Don't make it more difficult for yourself by adding those hurdles in before you have to mm-hmm. jump. I, I want to say something to get you guys' takes on this. Um, when I look at the ministry of the, this guy in the Bible named Jesus, um, <laughs> I, I see a lot of him putting out love, him doing acts of miracles, blessings, healings, feeding people, being a lot of his ministry. Of course, he also did preach. And then when people came to him with questions of, hey, is this right? Whatever. A lot of times he'd ask another question back. He, he wouldn't necessarily give them the answers. He's Jesus. He knows all the answers. Is this sort of the model that we're getting at? Just kind of, hey, loving people and letting them wrestle with their own ideas sometimes? Is that sort of where we're going? I mean, obviously we're not Jesus, but is that the right path maybe? <laughs> Professor Mullen, what are are your thoughts? I would agree with that, with just the caveat that we cannot accompany people into outright falsehood or into maladaptive coping mechanisms or into heresy or schism. And if they do end up in heresy or schism, one can only hope that actually by them going there, they may eventually be drawn back. Reminds me of that line from Bride's Head Revisited, that there's this metaphor of being, this person thinks that they're on, they're they're free, but that line goes to the end of the world, and with one twitch on the finger, you bring them back to the center. So I have had friends of mine that have left the Catholic Church. I have had friends of mine that have left Christianity. And I don't support that decision. I will let them know that I don't support that decision. But if they choose to do that, it does not mean that I end my friendship with them. And I feel often that pushing back too hard on that might actually make them dig their heels in even more. I'm going to provide a last parable before I start moving along here. (laughs) When I was a child... I was certainly glad the times that I did stupid stuff and got hurt that my parents didn't stop and explain to me why it was stupid first. I'm really glad that they addressed my pain first (laughs) and then said, hey, that's stupid. Don't put your hand on the stove, you know? (laughs) I'm glad they did that first. (laughs) All right, guys, as you know, we usually ask our guests at the end of the episode what a single tangible action that would help unite the church would be. This time, I want to ask something different. Rather than a single action we can take, could you guys give us a single instance where you think it would be best to not give an action, to not say anything? Um, Christian, would you like to go first this time? I mean, yeah, sure. And and to do this requires understanding people. If you see someone and they're coming for a fight, I mean like a physical fight, but a a verbal sparring, that's probably not the best time to engage. Mm -hmm. Defend the gospel as need be. Defend truth, but don't cause them to just say, oh, well, that, that Christian over there got angry. Oh, that's exactly what I wanted. And I'm going to post it on social media and everyone's going to see it. Mm-hmm. Learn to relax. Learn to deal with people individually. And listen. Amen. Um, Professor Moreland, same thing. Could you just give us a single instance where you think it would be best to not give an action or to not say anything else? If a person is not being cautious with their speech. If they are, if they've removed the filter and are saying patently absurd things out loud, it's best not to challenge them. Some people do not have the layers of processes and filters that some of us have. And just because they say something out loud does not mean that they're necessarily serious about it. So it's good to discern there that even when they say something that might be very absurd or illogical, that they may be in a process. And as long as they don't persist in that, um, and they I've never experienced them to do that, that's not worth fighting. That's not worth doing anything. Hmm. Hmm. 
All right. So, um, Professor Morlan, I'll throw this one to you first. If we didn't fight in those incidents, if we just kind of let it be, what do you think would be different than, you know, the mode, the, you know, the immediate reaction we'd like to take now being always to debate, always to fight back? I think that you would find more opportunities for growth. I think you'd find more opportunities for healing and for convergences. Because when someone else is hurt, empathy is really important. And finding points of contact where you can identify with their hurt. And a lot of times, even if it comes from a different place, the raw emotion and the feeling of being marginalized, the feeling of having something taken away from you, whatever it is, those are where there are points of convergence. So I would say that this is where healing and maybe even some synthesis can happen, the creation of new ideas. Sometimes we don't solve things by opposites. Sometimes we solve issues by transcending them. Yeah. Christian, um, so same question. As we sit in things, as we don't act all the time, as we learn when to be quiet, what do you think would change in the church? You're going to see there's going to be some peace that didn't exist before. Not a false peace of we just let them have their say and we're going to hate them behind their backs. We've allowed them to speak and now we need to be firm in what is truth and when the next opportunity comes we can strike is the wrong word. Converse (laughs) appropriately. And sometimes we can even agree with what they're saying and take them by surprise. Be like, oh, well I am tired of all of these sex scandals in the church. Uh, The last time I said I agreed with someone who was an atheist, they thought I'd slap them in the face (laughs) because they were used to people digging in their heels, like Professor Moreland said, and just defending, oh, no, that's not them. It's it's the Catholic's fault. It's the Protestant's fault. It's whoever. It's like, no. Agree with the truth and then work past that moment to where we can all figure out a way to actually have a discussion on this. A little bit of humility can go a long way. I know um, I, I was actually on a, a podcast once that was ran by an atheist who asked me, just point black, like, how, how is it useful to have a belief that you can't doubt, that there isn't whatever for it? I'm like, I don't know. I do doubt all the time. <laughs> you know, that's uh, faith isn't the absence of doubt. <laughs> that's, uh, you know, we've talked about that on the show before, so I, I won't dig too far into it. Um before we see, I, I didn't realize this was a round table at first, and it turned out that this was in fact a round table episode, everyone. <laughs> I before we adjourn, we always set up the next round table <laughs> in a round table discussion. And since Christian brought up abortion and I brought up evolution, it, it actually it reminded me something that um I don't have the exact quote in front of me, but maybe Professor Mullen can help me with this one. Um St. Augustine once talked about Christians kind of intermeddling with science and philosophy and stuff and basically said something along the lines of sometimes Christians need to know their lane (laughs) you know like that's obviously not the quote but I remember Augustine did say something about how he thinks it was foolish for Christians to be speaking or maybe they shouldn't be I don't recall that exact quote but I do know there's others where um, I think it was Bishop Hosius of Cordoba told the emperor at the time it's not your job to swing the censer. It's not our job to swing the sword. So stay away from the affairs of the church, and we will not give you advice on military strategy or governance. So yeah, there is there is some of that to be said. Yeah, uh, obviously we know the whole separation of uh, state and church stuff that a lot of early Christian Americans believed in some of our founding fathers even said something about it's not in the constitution just one anyway um let's see if I'm, I'm trying to find augustine believed religion and science do not occupy separate spheres of understanding i don't know i can't find it i will find that quote and present it in the next round table guys how about that um because i think we did stumble onto and we're talking about stuff that maybe christians need to be quiet about M- maybe sometimes we shouldn't be arguing science and instead should be arguing the gospel and uh, sometimes that means just letting things go <laughs> or being willing to be wrong or being willing to be humble and say, I disagree. Here's my thought. Whatever. There's plenty of things I think we could dig into there. So hopefully we can come back 
and uh, Christian can open up another can of worms. <laughs> Hopefully not abortion the second time, but we'll see. <laughs> it might be. I'm the um, it's what that I being do. said, <laughs> you guys know we always like to, before we wrap up, have a God moment segment where TJ forces me to go first and share something God's done with me recently, whether it's a blessing, a challenge, whatever. Uh, since he's not here, I have to go first anyway, I guess. <laughs> So, um, I, there's been a lot recently. I've been working Mondays at Chipotle uh, because my job at Shutterfly has kind of had reduced hours and I still have ends over there. And I'm like, yeah, this is fun. I like working at Chipotle. Um, I've also started my own butterfly garden over here in, in both of those instances, it's been one of those where physical work and then I see something I created and I'm able to see other people enjoy it. Um, so whether it be food or gardening, it's just God, kind of God reminding me, maybe not necessarily pride is the right word, but the blessing of having joy in creating something. So that was just, it's been a cool blessing. It's kind of ongoing. I'm still benefiting from that one. Um, Christian, do you have a God moment you'd like to share with everybody? Uh, yes. At the start of the show, you mentioned that I attend two churches. Uh, that is no longer true. Oh, uh, as I'm a liar. The second church that <laughs> spun off the first uh, is no more. And oh. that is something I did not want to happen. I was angry when it happened, but what happened from that was a lot of spiritual growth that God didn't want it to be there. So fighting against him would be a terrible idea. And the pastor of that church uh, stepped down from the position and just said, look right now, I think God wants me to be a disciple and not a teacher. So I can either accept that that's what God said, or I can fight against it and be wrong. And that was a huge moment that I needed to understand he's in charge. If he wants something to remain, it will remain. Hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a big challenge. So we got a blessing. we got a challenge. Um, uh, Professor Moreland, uh, I think, uh, I'm trying to think of what that leaves you with. We already did the blessing and challenge. So you, you got to do something more unique, I guess. <laughs> no, did you have a God moment you'd like to share with us though? Uh, yes. Um, something that, has really become apparent to me this month is that we can love things that are imperfect. We can love things that are in progress. And mm -hmm. I think that for so much of my life, I thought that to be loved or to love something, it must be perfect. And I was recently up in DC visiting one of my best friends and I saw the way that he was parenting his child and it really inspired me to realize that, okay, this child is not perfect. This child's not fully developed, but she is being loved and supported. And I realized that I do the same thing with my advisees and that, you know, for example, Sister Rose did that with me. So mm, we, me we have to be, you know, we have to remind ourselves to love something. It doesn't have to be perfect. Another God moment. Every so often on the whole church, we just like to celebrate Sister Rose. So I'm glad we have another one of those moments. Oh, yeah. Amen. She she is truly a blessing. Um, mm -hmm. Christian, did you ever have any any runnings with Sister Rose? I did at not. UNCW? Uh, the podcast was actually my introduction to her. Uh, well, she's still blessing people in whatever ways that she can. I love what she's on. And uh, yeah, she's yeah, on a very too. well deserved uh, retreat, vacation, travel thing right nice. now. So. Yeah, she made me read um, Beth Moore's book. Is it Beth? Why? Why? Why am I blanking on this? The the, the one of um, I don't know. It has to do with uh, feminism and biblical biblical womanhood. There we go. I found oh, yeah. it. Biblical womanhood. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. I know that one. Yeah, the incredible read. So I think she's going to be on to talk about that. Um, Pastor Will will be on in the future, also specifically to talk about different beliefs people in the church have about abortion, because there are different views even within the church. Which is interesting. It'll be an interesting topic, and that'll be before our next roundtable where we're going to talk about science and Christianity, when we should be a part of the debate, and maybe when we shouldn't. Um, that being said, guys, if you want to hear more from me and TJ Tiberius Juan Blackwell, which I know you guys want to hear more of him, go over to systematicgeekology.org. Hit the host button. Down in the drop-down menu, you have both of our names. You can find everything that we do right there. He's not here to plug it, so I'm going to plug it for him. We have an incredible Patreon uh, series called Pet Peeves, 
where we ask our guests about their pets and their peeves in the church. Um, it's a really fun time. So if you guys go to go over to patreon.com forward slash whole church podcast, you can support the show, get access to those shows. And it, it's a fun time. Uh, thank you all for listening to the whole church podcast. We hope you enjoyed the episode. We hope that you will share it with a friend or a cousin. There you go, DJ. Coming up, we will be interviewing Chad M. Mansbridge, pastor of Bayside Church in Southern Australia, about his book, You Can Handle the Truth. We will then interview Dr. David Whitcomb about his book, about how his father's contribution to young earth creationism and his own research with genetic sciences. And after that, we will be continuing our Dividing Scripture series, looking at the beast of the book of Job. Of course, at the end of season one, Francis Chan might be joining us. He doesn't know it yet, but uh, I'm sure it'll happen. It's, It's not a big deal, guys. Thank y'all for listening. Thank you for listening to the Whole Church Podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. And remember, you can always support the show on Patreon for as little as $3 a month. Thank you for listening.